Hi, my name's Emma. My name's Rob. And we're really pleased that you've joined us for this podcast, Hope and the City. The city being Plymouth, where we live, and hope being something we all need because life can be tough. And on this podcast, we've been talking about some of the things that you faced, some of the things that I've faced, and the guests that we brought into this conversation. What is hope and how does it stand up to real life? Absolutely. So here's just a few few clips just to kind of give you an idea of the things that we'll be talking about. A hope that I think we would say, first of all, stands up to real life. Yeah. So when we talk about hope, it's not an anaesthetic. It's not a sort of crossing my fingers and hoping for the best. If hope is real hope, it stands up to real life. Mm. And as you shared, uh, even death. If hope can stand up to death, it's real hope. And I said how useful it was to help clarify my thoughts, get them in order, especially um, when you've had a discussion with a doctor and they give you like a lot of information and you just need to like order it in your mind really. I found the blog really useful for that um, and as other family members did as well. And then the journaling, I mean it's something like you hear in Christian circles used quite a lot doesn't it? People talk about journaling. But people but keep I, diaries. Yeah. All, all kinds of people keep diaries don't they? And also I think in counselling, in counselling I think they encourage people to journal because it's almost like that letter that you don't send where you can just spill everything that you're feeling onto paper and actually it it just does help with that whole process so so I've always been a big journaler as you can see this is just got, yeah. like the six months I think leading up to James's oh, a few books for people who can't see <laughs> there's quite a few books on the desk there he knows what's coming around the corner so whilst it might be a surprise to me it's not a surprise to him mm. and therefore if he's put it on my plate I can be, and he knows me better than I know myself. Yeah. That gives me confidence or hope that I can go through it. Yeah. And then when I go through something that before I would have just checked out from or run away from, I've then got some experience of it to say, huh, we got through that. Yeah. I got through that. Yeah. It's, it's a visible um, representation, like I said earlier, of an invisible God, isn't it? that the invisible God who's with us at all times is listening. And by them being the physical person that can represent God, we're able to listen in. And just by sitting there and yeah. being there. Yeah. I mean, I didn't start drinking every day from 11 years old. Yeah. That was just the first time I got drunk and I got absolutely hammered, puking up for <laughs> at least the, the whole night and most of the next day. But it was, as you say, it was a way that I could be the person that in my dreams I hoped I could be. Mm -hmm. uh, but also a way that I could be carefree. I had some peace from some of the anxiety and the things that, you know, I've yeah. touched on there. So yeah. it wasn't a problem wasn't a problem every day. Uh, I think the next time I got drunk was probably 14 years old. But certainly by 15, 16, every time I was going out, I was getting absolutely obliterated. Yeah. Soft yeah. drugs were coming in yeah. mid-teenage years. By late teenage years, it was class A drugs. So there was a slippery slope as I was still chasing that feeling of the first time I drank. Yeah, well, somebody uh, once said to me, and I can't remember where it came from or whether I read it, but it said grief being like uh, standing in the sea with your back to the waves. And while you think you've managed to get yourself to a place of, of functioning, um, and where you can actually perform daily tasks and live a little, again, actually it feels like out of nowhere come these big waves and they knock you off your feet and you never know where they're coming, when they're coming. So when you're stood with the back to the waves, you just, yeah. they just knock you, don't they? Um, yeah, and it reminded me, we went, um, Abby and I, my daughter Abby and I went sea, well, not swimming, dipping, dipping I would say. Said. Yeah, yep. dipping uh, this weekend twice, actually. And I was reminded of that. But then somebody else also said to me, sometimes we can make moments to embrace our grief and feel our pain. Um, you know, like we said, with the right person, maybe a conversation or... Or an event. Yeah, or an event. Going to get a few people together to, on an anniversary yeah, and yeah. allow yourself to... Those spaces of grief. And actually, it feels like you are able to invite grief in on your terms. So one of the things we were talking about um, just before we went on air about the waves, and we were saying about almost inviting the grief in means that you're able to turn around and face the wave as it comes, which means you can prepare for it. So those are just some of the conversations that we'll be having over the next few weeks. And we really want you to interact with us. So please put your comments. You're very free to email us with any subjects you want us to cover, which are going to be particularly important for you or for people that you love. And that email address is hope at crplymouth.co.uk.